Uh, four, four, just seven, stand by a minute. Just come on, uh, uh, what is your attack angle? Okay, talk to him, see what that did. Charlie Hurts, 88. Uh, 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 just made a pass in there. Can you give us any? Uh, two, one, ten, seven. Anybody over a couple Okay, I'll three. put it a little closer than those trees. Let me come around with a loud three, and I'll put it on those trees there. Uh, Roger that, loud three. Uh, you know, I wasn't happy uh, there. It uh, wasn't what I wanted to do. I mean, there was the mission. You tried to perform it. Um, my assignment out of there was to be an instructor in the A1 at Hurlburt. And that's the last thing I wanted to do. Uh, my wife, we wrote letters back and forth. took five days to get it. She said, you know, she had never been overseas. Maybe I could get an assignment in Europe, fly some kind of fighters in Europe. I said, well, if I go over there, I'm going to be sitting on alert. And I did alert before I went through the test pilot school. I'm tired of being on alert and flying a couple days, then on alert, a couple days off, and on alert. It's a, it just got old. So I said, I, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Uh, I like the testing, so I'm going to get out of the Air Force. And so I resigned to be effective when I came back. I didn't have a job. Now I had a seven-year-old son and a four-year-old son, and I'm unemployed coming back to uh, California. But I set up some interview trips and got a job with Hughes Aircraft Company and flew with them for, uh, for 20 years. And, uh, and that, was, that was good. I, I was more of an aviator than an officer. I loved the airplanes, uh, but the only place these airplanes are is in the military. <laughs> I mean, they don't, you don't buy an F-4 and go fly it unless you're extremely wealthy. It takes countries to own airplanes like that. But Hughes had military airplanes that they were putting weapon systems on and doing testing. And I was good at that. I was really, really, really good at that uh, in working with the engineers and, and, and uh, fly-off competitions. I was involved uh, with the uh, F-14 program, the F-15, the F-16, the F-18, the stealth bomber. Maverick Missile, a whole host of extremely successful smart weapons that were made for the Cold War, but in fact used during the Gulf War. And so uh, I, after the combat book, I decided to write a book about um, my 20 years with Hughes Aircraft Company to include Howard Hughes stories. Because the senior pilots, the old guys, when I went to work with Hughes, that were 45 years old, had been World War II pilots, they were hired by Howard. They flew with Howard. The mechanics who worked on my airplanes worked on Howard's airplane. There was all kinds of Howard Hughes stories floating around. Uh, he was unfortunately drugged up in Vegas at, at the time, but everybody said, you know, he's a private airport, he has his own airplanes, he could fly in here at any time, so always be ready. He could, he could be right there. Even his racer, the air, airplane he set the world speed record in 1935, was in a Quonset hut right next to ours. And when visiting Air Force Navy pilots would come, I'd take them over there, it had a big tarp on top of it, I knew the caretaker of all of the Hughes airplanes, and so he would let us in. You had to get a flashlight because there was a big tarp on this and get underneath it and kind of work your way up because pilots always want to look in the cockpit. I always thought, you know, might find Howard sitting in there <laughs> asleep or, or dead or dead. Anyhow, um, so I uh, decided to uh, write a book about my 20 years um, with Hughes Aircraft Company and had a pretty big manuscript uh, about Howard and about my 20 years with that. Meanwhile, my acquisition editor for the combat book, Cheating Death, Mark Gatlin, he moved from Smithsonian over to being the director of the Naval Institute Press. So he contacted me and said, how are you doing on, on, the, on the Hughes book? And I said, well, I got a pretty big manuscript, but an interesting thing. In my research of getting Howard Hughes materials, I run into a screenwriter in LA who is writing a screenplay about Howard Hughes and wants to get a movie made. And we had shared some, some information. He used some of mine for his screenplay. I used some of his stuff. Uh, it turns out that he became one of the four producers of the movie, The Aviator. 
asked me if I wanted to be a technical consultant, and I said yes. So the movie is going to come out in December of 2005. I've got a manuscript uh, that is 150,000 words uh, in about like February, March of 2005. So Mark Gatlin says, okay, here's, here's what we'd like to do. Split that book in two. Make one a biography of Howard Hughes, and we want that out two months before, before the movie. So we can take advantage of the movie coming out. Then the other will be your third book now, which is about your, your 20 years. But he said, I can only give you two months to break it up with all the production things that oh, you yeah. have to do. So I broke it up, and I said I can do it, and sent him the manuscript. My book came out in October of 2004. Got contacted by the Air and Space Museum in downtown Washington. They wanted me to give a talk from my book uh, in their IMAX theater. Have you ever been to the Air and Space Museum? I'm yeah. IMAX theater about Howard Hughes on a Wednesday evening, free to the free to the public. And giving a talk in an IMAX theater is really a toughie because all of the seats go up like this, and you have this humongous. Uh, screen behind you and like so six stories, seven oh it five. is huge and when you're standing here at the podium and looking back and forth and everything I got a little woozy <laughs> anyhow so the positive part about this is that I did I did give uh, I did give the talk the following day was a Thursday November 11th Veterans Day I got to go over to the wall I'd been there before but never on Veterans Day and to be there when guys are in uniform and a speech and all that, I mean, that was, that was super, uh, super duper. So um, technical consultant um, on that, I read it, didn't think it was very good. Turns out the movie was made. Uh, my guy invites me to the premiere. We go to the premiere, we have 50 yard, it was in a theater, 50 yard line seats right there. Uh, afterwards, talk with DiCaprio. He asked me, how did I do? Well, you made $20 million. That's, that's not too bad. But the interesting thing on that is he went into details of, of how I did. And there was a group of people. I felt very uncomfortable because I wasn't, you know, in this situation, the fact that the screenplay wasn't accurate wasn't his fault. He memorizes his lines, he stands where he is, he says his line and you know you start over with another one. So it wasn't his fault that that was that was phony. So I got a caught out guard. I did give him a, a positive review. What I thought about afterwards in thinking about that that situation was that, uh, like uh, like John, he's an actor, so he does his thing, and then the director calls him over and says, you know, going to do shoot number 22, 3, 4, 5. This time, turn your head here and put more emphasis on that word or whatever it is. You got to listen, and then you got to do it. We're not used to doing that. We kind of talk on a high level. It doesn't make any difference how you talk, I talk, or whatever. It's just kind of, you know... It's different for probably an actor like that. And that's kind of the way he treated me as a director. <laughs> I'm not a director, but I was Johnny on, on the spot. Uh, I mean, this is a highfalutin guy. He won five Academy Awards. Interesting thing, um, you know, when I was getting my book published, uh, I talked with uh, the screenwriter and I said, uh, you know, my publisher says, is there any way that DiCaprio or... Scorsese could write a cover quote or do something like that. He said, let me, let me check. And he said, no, they'll just think that uh, you're leeching on, on their movie, which is exactly what I, what I was doing. <laughs> and and, I, uh, he, and he, they also said, you know, he told me, he said, both of them have a fear of flying. He said, why are they making the aviator then if if they don't even care for aviation, they don't want to be a, in an airplane. And he's, and so we talked over and he said, you know, they're going for the Academy Award. 
This is, um, they, they remembered uh, the movie, what was the one on autism? Uh, um, you know the one I mean. Yes, I do. Okay. Yes. Um, few people had heard much about autism at that time until uh, Dustin Hoffman played, uh, played the part of that. So they feel that Howard had obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. And so that's what they play in this. They made it an epic, the uniforms, the outfits that they wore, the music and everything was, was big time. So they were going for the Academy Award. Uh, they did very good in Golden Globe, but we got beat out by Clint Eastman and his Million Dollar Baby uh, that won the, uh, won the Academy Award. Both of them have gone on to, you know, DiCaprio's gotten the best uh, uh, actor and Scorsese also. Uh, so, you know, they're high highfalutin uh, people. So they, they went, went on, uh, but it was, it was fun to be a part of that, uh, of that ac activity. Uh, it all became because of, of, of writing, writing the book. Um, so I've had a good run in aviation and art I've written five books now, five nonfiction aviation books. Um, you don't make a lot of money on that, but that wasn't my intention ever. Um, it's it's preserving your history, telling the yeah, story. That, that's been been a good good time. Take one. Take Fast movers in the night meet search and rescue at first sight.
um, and also probably unusual because I got out of the military. So I didn't have the connections with, with other people. Uh, but to a degree, I was still kind of in. I was still flying military airplanes, doing military tests, going to military ranges and everything, but I wasn't on active duty. I was a, I was a civilian. But, um, you know, I guess the irony for me is that when I was at Edwards as a fighter test pilot, it was absolutely the best job in the world. Best, best job in, in the world. The guys that, uh, the senior guys, majors and colonels, had shot down MIGs in, uh, in, in Korea. Uh, they were smart, they were good pilots, they had beautiful wives. I mean, they were just the cream of the crop. And I was awed to fly with them. They were flying the X-15. Uh, these, these were better than the, than the uh, Mercury astronauts. Uh, seriously, they, they were really b better than that. And uh, the idea was for me, Stay there as long as you can, work your way up. They're not gonna give a new guy uh, the big jobs. You gotta work your way up uh, through, through that. And the longer you stayed, the better it would be. So I didn't wanna volunteer to go to war with a three-year-old son and a six-year-old son. And so I waited it out and I got assigned to go fly this tailwheel prop airplane in Southeast Asia. The worst thing that I could get I need to go over there and fly 105s or F4s and shoot down a couple MIGs, go back to Edwards with a big badge, you know. Now I got credentials. Move me up. Deep select me. Let me get to fly the X, X-15. I'm going in a tailwheel prop. And um, I thought, what is this? Well, then I find out, you know, we're involved with rescue and the mission, and, and you get caught up in that. Uh, I mean, that was probably... If I'd flown F4s or 105s, there was hardly any uh, MIGs out there. I wouldn't have been ace or get any, any shots like that. But I was involved with a mission that was outstanding with guys that were really, really good. And that was something else that kind of came to in writing the book, is how good these A1 pilots were in delivering bombs and doing the, the rescue role. And I thought back, you know, I flew with guys that became admirals and generals and astronauts, and one guy w went to the moon. I don't think those guys were as good a pilots as these guys. And some of these were instructors, some were flight and safety officers, some were maintenance officers. None of them appeared to be a, on a fast track to make general. Why were they so good? Uh, the only thing I can come up with is that they rose to the occasion. It was a team, and nobody wanted to let the team team down. We're not going to lose because of me. I'm going to I'm going to do what I can do, and so you get caught up with this team, kind of a team spirit. If you've ever been on a, a team or a play or something where everybody is supporting each other, uh, it's a, that's a big thing, and it's easy really to get carried away with that. It it, it, it is it's something pretty big. So we really, and reality is the opposites that we have in life. It was the best assignment that I could, could have ever gotten. Um, and so it led to writing a book. It led into like, CSAR. I was in charge of all of the programs and getting people together. And 50 years later, we're still getting together and going over our stories. And now we meet the survivors like... Uh, um, <clears throat> John Piricello, um, I mean, that is amazing that I was able to connect with him and get him to come to one of these events and that he would go over to Laos and find his dad's wreckage on the ground. What are the odds that all of that would come together? Um, that story alone, I was in Fort Walton Beach two years ago when those three guys sat down, it was Brian Danielson, John Piricello, and there was another gentleman. Right. All of their fathers were MIA. Right. And they'd heard that the wing off Brian's father's plane was in this orphanage or a church <laughs> or he was in it. So Brian said, I'm going back. <laughs> and we, you know, they'd, they'd been looking for his father. And when they got there, it wasn't Brian's wing. 
he had brought those two guys with him. And it turned out to be the third fellow's father's wing. And then they decided to go up the river to another wreck site. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think John was staying back by the boat. He was like, I'm tired, you guys go ahead. <laughs> And Brian and the, the other gentleman had walked up through the jungle and John, you know, called them and he said, get back here, get back here. And they had walked right over the radial engine and right. the cowling right. of John's father's <laughs> right. plane. I know. And when I talked to Brian, at first he was disappointed because, you know, he hadn't achieved his mission right. to find the wing right. of his father's plane. But what he did was he took two other guys that their, their fathers were missing in action or killed in action, and they were able to actually touch the parts of theirs. So you don't always get out of life what you think you want. What you want. But, you know, the, I, I really believe that there is something that leads us, right. just like you with your A1 story, it was the, it's what Best, you needed. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it, it was not what I wanted, but what I got, and, and I made the best of it, mm -hmm. too. And sometimes you have to make the best best of it uh, for whatever it was.